All right, welcome everybody to part two of our webinar series, How to Manage Your Supply Chain in uh, Crisis. This is a follow-on webinar to the previous one where we looked at how to manage demand signal in um, times of chaos, such as uh, right now we're going through the COVID-19, um, I don't know what you would call it, pandemic, I guess, is more accurate. So uh, in a webinar, which we'll, we'll link to here and you should find in our webinar channel, um, last week we did on demand signal management. We've had a secondary webinar because it was so, um, because of the interest about how to manage the supply signal. So how to take multiple demand scenarios, run it through, in this case, we're gonna use a supply chain, um, mock up a, a simple supply chain, but still using optimizers to show some of the basic concepts around how you would manage, evaluate, and move forward with a supply chain signal. So let's go ahead and get started. So today uh, we'll go through a quick intro uh, with my co-hosts and, and actually they're going to be carrying most of the weight, Megan and Kyle. We'll do a quick recap of what we looked at last time, uh, specifically around the demand scenarios. So there's a couple of demand scenarios that have been passed from um, from the demand into the supply area where we'll pick up with, and then Kyle will mostly lead a, um, a live system demo. So this is gonna be an optimizer scenario showing uh, the impact of each demand signal on your supply chain and what that means upstream and downstream. So that should be a real in useful session for those that wanna see how today's interconnected tools uh, can better manage your supply chain in chaos. So with that, um, we'll do a quick overview of who we are, so SCM Connections. Um, that's our firm. We're a supply chain consulting firm specializing in SAP technologies. So really we focus on uh, using technology to solve problems, which is why we do webinars like this, showing how uh, tools like IBP can help you manage your demand and supply issues uh, no matter what they are, not just a tool, but how it actually goes and applies to what you're doing on a day-to-day -day basis. So with me here, I think the next one is our introduction. So that's myself, Pat Green. Um, we also have Megan and Kyle who do who put this together from a coordinated demand and supply um, picture. And they're gonna go ahead and walk through what that looks like um, in the tool set. So we'll start with just saying, you know, this is a bit of an exception. Um, I think everybody has seen this at some point, whether it's lines outside of Costco, constant news stories about hospitals and, and state and federal governments competing for PPE, looking for retailers that are completely shut down, other retailers that are seeing demand they've never experienced before, and, and some others even just pivoting from uh, sales chains. Maybe there was a, a food a consumer products company that was... Um, you know, split between retail and food service now is 100% retail because there's no such thing as food service anymore. Um, everybody's experiencing this crisis a bit differently, but it also resonates across multiple uh, scenarios that we've seen in the past, whether that's tariffs, uh, if you have a globalized supply chain, or that's hurricanes or tornadoes, if you have um, plants or, or customers impacted by those scenarios, whether it's, you know, government, um, issues, whether it's social media disruption, could be classified as an act of God, I guess, where you'd have demand spikes out of nowhere that, that were unforecastable. And that's what we're looking for is if you have some event that nobody can plan for, uh, you're not really allowed to give up, especially in a planner role. So how do you go about managing that going forward and providing the best solution um, go, you know, in, for your company? And what I like to do when I describe this is there are no good solutions. When you find yourself in these scenarios, all the good solutions are have left, right? There's no there's no room for that. So how do you pick the least terrible option that you have in front of you and sort of mitigate the damage going forward? And that's what we'll look through today. So in addition to volatile demand, which I talked about, the expectation is still being responsive. I mean, I, I'm just as guilty of as the rest. You go to the grocery store and you're frustrated, not because there's no food, but because the right brand of cereal or the right, you know, <laughs> you can just get used to having what you want when you want when you need it and being able to give that information to your customers uh, whether you're selling something like hospital equipment where it's life and death or whether you're just trying to keep food supply chains in business or even just provide decent line of sight to your customers all of this goes down to visibility and and um, the ability for real-time data analysis and collaboration so so no longer is it 
um, is it feasible for a supply chain to wait an overnight batch job to see if it's going to work or a weekend run to see if the demand signal improves? Those days are long gone. And right now, table stakes is being able to react from end to end supply chain as fast as, as you can and provide real answers in, in the context, language, and place that your customers and your and your partners demand it. And, and that has become the reality for supply chains over the past 15 years. You add in global interconnected supply chains and you add in disruptions like we're seeing now and, and the stakes and the, and the room for error um, are a lot higher. So it's not all doom and gloom. Um, <laughs> Kyle is going, is, and Megan are gonna help you walk through what that looks like. And I think um, kicking off um, with the demo, right? Um, so I'll start off uh, with a quick recap from our demand management webinar from last week. Um, Kyle, can you go to the next slide? <clears throat> All right. So uh, basically what we did last week was we put ourselves in the shoes of a demand planner of uh, their product is pink dress shirts. Um, and as, as you can imagine, our demand has decreased or our sales have decreased exponentially and we want to we know that our current demand plan is is not correct and our, our baseline plan is not correct and we need to make a quick adjustment. But what we don't really know is when, what we didn't know, what we still don't know is when our demand is going to stabilize or if it's going to stabilize. And so what we decided to do was we used our tools available um, in IBP. So first we took a look at our statistical forecast, but we know that our actuals, um, our recent actuals are, are are not a good baseline for for what we want to forecast in our future forward-looking uh, forecast to look at. So that so that wasn't a good enough tool. So next we looked at our um, our history cleansing in IBP, and and it wasn't accurate enough uh, because our variations in demand have been growing so much. And so then we took a look at our uh, our sales and our marketing forecast, and these are also really high because we have similar inputs right and none of us really expected to see this large of a drop in our sales and so what we did um, we decided that this these three things they weren't enough so we um, used IBP to model our model our demand scenarios and that's what you see on the screen right here so we wanted to take these scenarios into our SNLP meeting and help minimize the risk and you know, try to understand what is our best path forward. And so the first scenario that you see here uh, is a bounce back scenario. And the scenario is where we're gonna see the recovery um, pretty quickly, but uh, we need to understand and quantify what that recovery really means um, on the supply side as well. And then and the next is the midterm recovery. Um, and we, we're going to see a stabilization, but it's going to take a little bit longer than, than what we were expecting and, and what we saw in the bounce back um, scenario. And then the third scenario that you see here is this long term demand recovery. And so this is also similar to the midterm, but it's just taking taking longer to get back to that stabilization point. And, um, and is this the new normal and, and how are we going to how are we going to kind of plan for all of this? And so when we did this, uh, we took all of these scenarios and we brought them into IBP. And so Kyle, can you pull up the Excel? All right. And so this is our consensus demand plan. And you can see all of the different scenarios that I just spoke about. And what we're going to do today is Kyle's going to take these scenarios and he's going to transfer them into the supply um, optimizer. And we're going to see how our demand actually directly impacts, uh, how our demand decisions directly impact uh, the supply side. So Kyle, you want to take it away with the supply side? Perfect. Yep. So the first thing I'm going to show you is the, the network. So you're just going to, have a general understanding of what we're going to show you here in the simplified model. So the demand that Megan was referring to right now we're saying is just coming from one customer just to keep it simple and its name is Retailer One. 
Uh, like she had said before, we're only forecasting uh, or getting a, a consensus demand for a single product. In this case, it's a pink dress shirt. So this uh, retailer one here can actually have its demand fulfilled by two locations. Uh, one is a DC in Seattle, the other is a DC in Boston. Both of those distribution centers can receive the pink shirt from either a plant in Philadelphia or a plant in San Jose. Each of these plants then in turn have their own independent resources for that product. Now, this is a shameless plug for a previous webinar that we did uh, where we actually modeled having an external vendor. Uh, so if you want, you can go look at that webinar later on on our YouTube channel. But for now, in this particular example, we're not modeling any external vendors. It's just straight from the resource to the plant. Now, one more thing to note, and we'll see this when we're comparing the baseline scenario with one of the midterm or long-term recovery scenarios, is that the Philadelphia plant is three times cheaper to produce these pink dress shirts at than it is in the San Jose plant. And uh, we'll see how Optimizer takes this into account when creating its, its best supply plan. All right, so now we're gonna move into uh, planning view and IVP. Uh, again, for any of you that are familiar with IVP or those of you who are not, uh, you know, the, the front end is easy to use because you're using Excel. And most of us live in Excel day to day. So the learning curve for IVP is pretty minimal in terms of, of working with the data and uh, transitioning everything. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to walk through each of these tabs, laying out what Optimizer has already determined to be an optimal supply plan for the baseline scenario. So in this case, what I'm going to show you is, again, baseline, which means this is before any of the drop in demand. This is what our original projection for demand was going to be uh, before the pandemic hit. So what you can see here is for retailer one, again, we're looking at the consensus demand, which fluctuates between 6,500 and 7,500 over so many weeks. Now, what you'll notice right off the bat is the bar chart above, you see the difference between the consensus demand in blue and the total customer seats in this beautiful E green. Now, what this is telling us right off the bat is exactly what this key figure calculation is telling us, and that is we're actually shorting the customers in every month. Now, the reason for this, as you can probably assume based on the large rounded numbers here, is that we are capacity constrained at this point. So even though we have two manufacturing plants for these pink dress shirts, in a normal scenario, we are constrained by the amount of product that our plant can actually produce. Now in the webinar that I referred to back in March on our YouTube channel, we have a different scenario where the demand is actually gonna increase, but our capacity is going to decrease. That's not the case here. What we're gonna show you is in the baseline where we have high demand and our capacity can't meet up and show you what Optimizer does when our demand drops and we have more capacity than we know what to do with. So the next tab, we're just going to go through and show you the, the benefit of Optimizer, which is it doesn't just plan one piece of the supply chain. So it doesn't just say how many customer receipts you're going to actually be able to give. It's actually going to go through and tell you, you know, based on the, the transportation lanes, how much supply in each given week, um, you know, what's the production receipts look like, what's the capacity utilization look like at your individual resources. And that's what we'll be stepping through in each of these tabs in our current planning view. So what you'll see here is, again, the DC in Boston and the DC in Seattle are providing these pink dress shirts to the retailer. And what we can see is that for the most part, the DC in Boston is supplying most of these products. Now, how does Optimizer know what to do? It's all based on the cost that we say, whether it's holding costs for inventory, customer delivery costs from the DCs to the retailer. Optimizer is gonna to try to pick the plan that makes uh, profitability the highest for you. And so in this case, this is the particular plan, how it's laid out. So in each week, we see how much each of the different DCs is supplying to the retailer. Now when we get to transportation, this is gonna show you the interlocation uh, transportation lines. And as we discussed before, 
the DCs in Boston and Seattle both received the pink dress shirts from the plants in Philadelphia and San Jose. If we just kind of focus up here on this top block of information, we're going to see the receipts. Now, receipts are when they're actually received at the shipping to location, right? So in this case, we're looking at DC Boston. Now, the another beautiful thing about Optimizer is the ability to take into account the different lead times. Now, in our model, we're just saying it's a one week lead time from the uh, either plant to either DC, but what you can uh, easily see here is that the transport supply is leaving the Philadelphia plant in Boston in this current week and it doesn't show up as a receipt until the following week. Now this is a pretty simple example but you can imagine if you have a global network and there are various lead times between you know hundreds of locations, uh, Optimizer automatically takes that into account when trying to determine what your best supply plan is. All right. Now, what we're going to see here again, just kind of like what we saw before, is uh, because we have more demand than what we can actually meet, if we look at the transport receipts from the plants to the DCs, and in this case, let's just look at the Boston DC, if we look up here at this graph, we're going to notice that for the most part, we're being fulfilled from 100% from the Philadelphia plant and the San Jose plant. Now, if we want to dig into this a little bit more, let's now look at the capacity tab. Now, again, Optimizer is going to say what is most profitable for us. And we've also said that it's most expensive to short customers, which is why you will see for capacity utilization for both the plant in Philadelphia and the plant in San Jose, that capacity utilization is completely maxed out in all weeks. So we're kind of a pedal to the floor. We're just trying to produce as much as we can to meet the huge customer demand that we see. Now, how does that impact the rest of maybe our targets that we're trying to hit? Well, if we take a look at the inventory tab, what you'll notice is right off the bat, if we take a look at, if we take a look at the, the graph up at the top, you're going to see that the inventory target is in this kind of fleshy pink color and that just goes right across the line and what you'll see is that the projected stock which should be in that key color green doesn't show up anywhere on the chart likewise if you look down at the individual key figures which are associated with each location you'll see in the pro projected stock row projected stock is always blank and that's because we're saying it's actually more expensive to short a customer than it is to violate our inventory targets, even though we have specified inventory targets. So for the DC in Boston, on a normal case, we would like to see uh, an inventory target of about 3,276 units in each calendar week. Likewise, for Seattle, we would like to see about 1644. But what Optimizer is now doing is based on the cost inputs we have, it's saying it's it's actually more profitable to actually short ourselves, so not meet our targets, and instead deliver as much product as we possibly can to the customers. Yeah. Now, another uh, great piece about IDP as well is um, the ability to easily calculate some of those high financial numbers. And this is simply based on kind of keeping your master data up to date. So if you have the data up to date and you want to see uh, at a quick glance, what am I, you know, what's my total production value or what are my gross profits look like? It's easily calculated. You don't have to do anything different besides running Optimizer, having it run the plan, and then it will automatically calculate these values for you. Additionally, you can see the flexibility of IDP in terms of just viewing the data and based on we're storing it at a, a very granular level. You can easily aggregate and disaggregate. So what you're looking at here is particular finance values in calendar weeks for the remainder of April. And then we aggregate to full months for May and June. And then we aggregate even further into quarters for Q3 and Q4 of 2020. This just gives you a better high level view and able, uh, enables you to kind of see a, a longer term plan in the appropriate granularity uh, for, for how you would want to view the data. Additionally, you can see some of these values make a lot of sense based on what we had previously seen in those tabs. So for example, if you recall, 
inventory, we said we weren't carrying any inventory right now because it was too expensive to short customers. So what you'll see is for the average projected stock value, you can see we have no projected stock, which again, matches what we saw before, until way out in Q4 where it looks like we get a little bit of reprieve, maybe from a, a dip in demand that we were already gonna forecast. Uh, and then we'll, we'll see that maybe we are we're able to actually hold some stock or meet some of our stocking targets. Likewise, you know, these are some high level values. We can actually look at individual spend. We wanna see how much are we spending on transportation or uh, how much are we spending on raw material? Again, this is just simply keeping your master data up to date, inputting those values, and then based on the optimal plan that Optimizer spits out, it'll automatically calculate this for you. And so we can see pretty quickly, what's our transportation costs gonna look like in Q3? Well, right now we're forecasting that it's gonna be about you know, 79,000, given the numbers that we have currently stored in our master data. Hey Kyle, when you're looking at these projections, we had uh, one question come in to see if the demand itself, when it's looking to meet that demand, if it can back order it or if it's just um, cut. I think that's a important piece as you set up the model because it can really define the production and transportation impact and, and the recovery specifically. If you want to carry that demand, the missed demand in the future, it's going to make that production strain a lot longer. And if it's like a fill or kill method, then it's going to uh, recover faster because that order is not going to show up again. Um, just to answer the question, IBP can handle either one of those. It just depends on how you uh, set up your system and your demand penalties to do it. Right. All right. So now that, again, we've walked through the baseline scenario, let's go back and pull in the midterm recovery scenario that Megan had been referencing before to see how the optimizer fine tunes the supply plan to again, still make it, you know, obviously not as profitable as would have been with the high demand before, but it makes it the most profitable given these, you know, terrible circumstances. So we're gonna go back to the customer demand tab just to show you the usability of, of IDP. And um, the, the nice part about the scenarios is, you know, you wanna A, B, different numbers and what, scenarios allow you to do is basically have two different data sets that you can run a supply optimizer on and compare for your entire supply chain. How does that look? Now, just in terms of brevity, we've already run optimizer for the different scenarios, but what we can easily do is edit this planning view, which we haven't really talked about before, but this is a, a wonderful feature of IBP, the Excel add-ins. You know, if you wanna see different attributes besides customer region or product description, you can easily add those here. Um, again, right now we're looking at a simplified model where we're only looking at one customer, but you can imagine that if you're not looking at one customer, but instead you're looking at a full customer region, or maybe you're looking at a customer group, you can easily pull those values in as long as you're keeping your master data up to date, and it will automatically on the fly aggregate and disaggregate the associated numbers. So that just shows the flexibility, I guess, of, of the tool itself. But what we can do now is instead of just looking at the baseline scenario like we've been doing thus far, we can pull in this midterm recovery. So again, this is where we have that extreme drop in demand, um, but then after about you know, four months or so, we start to recover that demand and it comes back up to some comparable um, values as to what we were seeing in the baseline. So I'm gonna go ahead and pull that data set in. And what you'll see, is that the planning view will actually change so that for every single value, we'll see what Optimizer was telling us for both the baseline plan as well as the midterm recovery plan. And the nice thing about this too, again, it's you're looking at one screen able to see you know, two different data sets at the same level. All right, so what we can see here is if we just focus on, let's look at the baseline. Um, once again, we were seeing that for baseline, the difference between consensus demand and the customer receipts, we were always a little bit under for customer receipts. And again, that's because our resources you know, weren't able to meet up with demand. But now, if we look at the midterm recovery, you see in these next few weeks, you can see demand drops extremely low. So we're looking at 230-ish units per week for a while. We know that given our capacity, 
we can actually handle that. And of course, as you would expect, Optimizer is showing that we're actually going to meet the customer receipts in each of those weeks. Great. So this isn't the, uh, the highlight of this particular scenario. What we really want to see is, you know, given the fact that our demand or input is so low, how is Optimizer going to make the rest of our supply chain profitable or the most profitable that it could be? So again, let's now look back at the DC to customer. And as we were discussing before, when you run Optimizer, you don't have to run it for different parts of your supply chain. It recalculates your entire supply chain. So that includes the transportation, the production, the inventory, everything at once. So now what we can see again is if we're looking at the DCs that are supplying to a retailer, you can see that there's a difference between the midterm recovery and the baseline simply for the DC Boston. So whereas in baseline we were shipping about you know 100, 200, 6,000 per, you can see it switches in a few months and it actually gives some of those customer uh, supply values down to the Seattle DC. And that's simply because it's uh, this will allow the rest of the supply chain to kind of fit into the different pieces that will make everything as profitable as it could be. The real way to see kind of what's happening here is let's look at the transportation. All right, if you recall, when we were looking at baseline before, I'm gonna pull baseline into this filter now. If you remember that when we were just looking at the Boston DC, we were getting transport receipts from both the San Jose plant as well as the Philadelphia plant. And that's because you know we were maxing out capacity. Well, now let's look instead of at baseline, let's take a look at this midterm recovery and see what's happening. All right, now you see a stark difference. Now you can see for the most part, we're getting all of our receipts from the Philadelphia plant. You might ask yourself, why would that be? Well, if you recall, when we were looking through the simplified supply chain, we were saying that it's actually three times cheaper to produce product at the Philadelphia plant than it is to produce at the San Jose plant. So now it's starting to make sense. Optimizer saw that it's much cheaper to make there, so it's gonna try to dump as much as it can, while it can, to the cheaper plant. What you'll also notice though, is that there is a little bit of uh, product produced at the San Jose plant in the current week. And that might seem a little bit odd, but you're actually going to see later on why it's doing that. Hey, Kyle, real quick, we had a question about shelf life planning. Yes. Does, um, does the optimizer take into account shelf life planning? And the answer is kind of it does. So there's a shelf life function, but when we've done projects for shelf life planning, specifically with that massive build you have there in week 18, um, what we've done is put a maximum inventory level on a product, so it would just prevent you from building above um, the shelf life, which would basically you'd be building it to throw out by definition of the demand signal. Um, so that is one element that would impact that. We don't have it turned on here, I don't believe, in this demo, but but it could handle the shelf life with a max inventory build uh, where you convert days into volume. Yeah, we, we currently do not have that turned on for this particular uh, demo. So now, now let's go into, uh, just to confirm you know, what we're seeing here, let's look at the capacity tab. And whereas before we were looking at, you know, everything was maxed out at 100% every time, now we're seeing something a little bit different. And if you look at the graph above, this is showcasing the midterm recovery capacity usage for both the Philadelphia plant as well as the San Jose plant. And what you're gonna see is that besides this calendar week 17, so next week, what you'll notice is that the Philadelphia plant is the only one producing anything way out until about week 27. And then all of a sudden we see a little bit of uptake in capacity utilization at that San Jose plant. Again, the reason for this is because our demand has dropped so low that one plant, and in this case, the cheapest plant can handle all of the customer demand. 
Now, and just to point out a... one, thing, one thing out here, because bringing it back to some of the real world applications, I mean, this is a simplistic model, but I think we want to show is if the question is what, you know, a panicked supply chain, what are we having to do with our plants? Right? Do we have to shut down? Do we have to furlough, lay off? I mean, there's a lot of complex scenarios. But what IVP was able to do very quickly was to show, okay, well, what does that look like from our production capacity? Right. And, and what I mentioned before, it'll show you the best of a whole bunch of terrible options. That's what you're looking at. Right. So if the green line is the San Jose plant, you can see there's really no need for about seven weeks for that plant to be running. And there might not even be a case for the Philadelphia plant to run that much in the near term or to spread that production out. So you're able to actually massage the, um, the kind of cold, hard numbers around the realities that you have. And, and give a better picture to say, what do we actually need? And then match that up against what you're actually going to do from an action point of view. But it will show you right away, look, we don't need a plant there. So, so how are we going to deal with that reality as unpleasant uh, as it might be? So now we can take a quick look then at the inventory tab, which is really highlighting kind of what's going on in, in this particular scenario. And Whereas before, you know, we weren't seeing any projected stock. Now, if we pull in just the midterm recovery into our chart up here, what you're going to see is that because demand is so low, we're actually able to produce enough. And as you saw in those spikes earlier in capacity in the calendar week 17, we're able to produce enough in the calendar week 17 to not only meet the customer demand, but also now start to meet our inventory targets. As you can see, the green bar in these weeks, right, you know, in the near term is butting up right against our inventory target line. Now, if we look at an individual, you know, inventory target. So again, let's look at DC Boston, where our inventory target was 3276. If we come down to the projected stock and we look at that, now we can see the stark difference between the baseline scenario and the midterm recovery. So what's happening here is you're seeing that we actually have projected stock in the midterm recovery. So what Optimizer was saying and what, what, it's, what it's doing is it's taking the fact that not only can we meet the customer demand, but we also have determined that it's cheaper for us to produce these 300 or 3,276 units in calendar week, you know, 17 and 18 and hold the stock than it is for us to violate the target that we're trying to hit. Again, this is, goes into fine tuning optimizer where you're you're giving a, a value of, you know, what how much do I want to penalize optimizer if it's not going to hit my inventory targets. Uh, so it's really it's kind of nice how how this piece works. Now uh, the other beautiful piece of this is if we kind of look a little bit longer out into the horizon. So again, we're looking at the midterm recovery, which means we're expecting the demand to come back up close to our baseline levels a little bit further out in the future. So let's take a look at this graph again and, and try to really focus on the inventory target line as well as the projected stock. And let's see what happens. So as we scroll out, we're going to start noticing that in looks like calendar week 30, we actually go over our inventory target. You might be thinking, okay, well, why? Why would we? Why would we be doing that? Well, if we keep looking out and out and out, what you'll notice is that our dependent demand, which is this red line, is starting to increase as well. And then all of a sudden, you'll notice that the projected stock drops, 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 and then way out in calendar week 53, you're going to notice it finally meets back up with our target. So what Optimizer is doing is it's actually no, it's not just planning your supply chain for the current week. It's looking at over the entire horizon that you're running your optimization for. And it's able to say that it's actually cheaper for us to start pre-building when we have the actual capacity and our demand is low, knowing that in the future, when our demand reaches back up to what we were you know, normally receiving and we couldn't produce enough, it knows to pre-build and it's actually cheaper to then pre-build hold the inventory, 
but be able to meet that customer demand in the future when we usually wouldn't have been able to due to capacity constraints. So that's again, the beautiful part about Optimizer, it, it does that automatically for you. You're really just keeping track of, you know, what are the different costs associated, and then it lays out the best plan. Um, we can easily then look at the finance side of it again, as before, and now we can A, B exactly what's going on. And this is just kind of giving you another rundown. If we just simply look at the average projected stock value, which is what we've kind of been focusing on a little bit, we can see that for baseline, again, we weren't able to actually meet any of that projected stock. But as soon as we were able to actually produce stock, we can now see what the average value of that stock is in the different, you know, either weeks, months, or quarters. You know, likewise, we can look at the different production value. And here's the other beautiful part is, you know, when we were going through the demand exercise, uh, we weren't just looking at a midterm recovery. We said that there was an immediate bounce back, there was a midterm recovery, and there was a long-term recovery. And let's say, you know, you're, you're getting asked these questions and trying to see what those values are around them. It's really simple. You have the inputs just like you did for the midterm recovery, you run Optimizer, and then all you have to do is, again, you just edit the planning view, which anyone can do, and you can pull in those different scenarios. And now right off the bat, what you'll see is we're not just A being, but now we can go A to B to C to D. And you can quickly see the financial impact uh, of the different demand signals. Okay. So now if we look at the total production value, you know, bounce back, we pretty, you know, we're seeing, um, more immediate uh, numbers than we are in some of these, you know, other other areas. In uh, gross profit, you can see, you know, if someone's asking you what's the difference in gross profit between our our baseline and long term. You know, you can tell you well out in Q4 of 2020, this is what we think we're going to be seeing. Um, the, the same goes for the spend categories, where you know you want to see how much do you think we're going to be spending on transportation, given any one of these scenarios. Well. Again, as long as you keep the data up to date for the master data side, it's pretty easy to see the difference between a baseline spend and a bounce back spend or a baseline and a long term recovery, you know, and you can go per quarter or, you know, per week, per month or out here where we're looking at a per quarter basis. Um, again, if you're running Optimizer, we just ran it for a full year. If you're running it for longer periods of time, maybe you want to see, you know, a, a yearly output. Um, that's all aggregation that you can easily done on the fly with a, a tool like IBP. Yeah, and I just want to point out, I mean, you kind of take these things for granted because it looks so basic, but the, you know, the ability to show it in dollars and cents means that you can bring these options into the meeting, right? And and kind of drill down, look up, look at, review them to see, you know, how you want to deal with it. Again, if it was an easy solution, you wouldn't, be doing all these scenarios you're doing it because it is a challenge and in this the won't i think one misconception people have about the optimizer is that it's going to give you the perfect solution with a button and, and i don't really think that's a great way to approach it i think what kyle's lined up here is the way to approach it which which is given the inputs and and the constraints and and the scenarios you feed it it will give you the most cost efficient way to manage it based on the inputs so if you're trying to manage three different realities it's going to give you the most efficient way to manage those realities, but it's still up to a human to go in there and, and manage what that final answer should be. Um, because at the end of the day, it's a person, it's a personal call. Cool. All right. Kyle, anything else for us? Or is that kind of where you wanted to leave it? I'm looking to see if we have any more questions here. I don't think that we do. One question was around the, the modules of IBP. If this was um, which modules you're utilizing to show this. Yep, so what we're utilizing right now is uh, for the supply side, the, the response and supply, um, and we're specifically looking at the supply piece of it. So this is the time series supply portion uh, yep. that we're looking at. Cool. Nice, all right. And so I think you know what we wanna do from here, um, there's no more questions, is to um, close up, close the, uh, the webinar.
and look at, again to our YouTube channel for other um, other webinars, the previous one especially, and look for future ones. Again, we appreciate everybody taking time out of their afternoon to attend, and uh, please look for future ones. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.